Welcome to the Climate and Coordination Rcast, where every week we'll be discussing topics related to all things climate change and our chain's role in the solution. We will be discussing technologies that can adapt and coordinate massive amounts of data like never before, forming social architectures that grow collective intelligence, sharing and evaluating data planetarily, all while maintaining personal privacy and personal data ownership. A new decentralized economy is forming as we move from the third industrial revolution, digitization, to the fourth, decarbonization, by building a co-op built on a correct-by-construction, concurrent, scalable solution our chain is structured to build out the new technology that will be required for a flourishing regenerative planet. Please join us on this journey. Welcome to this morning's Climate and Coordination Rcast. Um, Tom Moulton is with us and Jim Whitescarver are with us. Um, before I jump into the first topics, Tom, would you like to say a few words about yourself and, and how you came to this call and same with Jim? Sure. Um, well, basically I, I came to this call because, uh, in the late seventies, I was fortunate enough to go to a college at NGIT, uh, as a double E and ended up being a computer science major. And I got involved with a National Science Foundation funded project known as the Electronic Information Exchange System, which was researching into uh, human communication via computer. And all of the technology that we experimented with are the foundation of email, uh, bull, um, uh, forum postings, uh, collaborative work, uh, you know, joint documents, things like that, Google Cloud, dual documents, things like that. All of those concepts we dealt with back in the late 70s and uh, it's taken the world this long to catch up. Uh, so Jim invited me, I've known him for forever. I met him at NGIT and become good friends. And uh, that was, uh, oh, oh geez, almost over 40 years ago. <laughs> Amazing. Well, and welcome. Tom is Tom is a member of the cooperative, and uh, uh, he's uh, helped out with some of the uh, uh, development work. Uh, he's currently working on a uh, uh, a, a, a cloud for uh, a, a blockchain uh, cloud uh, services where we all contribute. And hopefully we'll be able to run an R node on that system soon. It's a fuse or a uh, flux. 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 Yeah. <laughs> well, that's Take awesome. Up. Welcome, welcome, Tom. We're glad to have you here, and welcome, Jim. Welcome back, I should say. Um, it's great to have everybody here. Um, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So, so, oh, hello, Greg. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to be quiet for the next uh, little bit. Fantastic. Um, okay. Well, not fantastic, but I mean, totally <laughs> fine. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, golden, yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So here's the first article for today. Um, I wanted to share this because there's a cool little resource in here. I was hoping that um, Steve Ross Talbot would be on the call today, but anyway, I'm sure he'll listen to this later. This is from The Guardian, and this is a little article about the air quality um, in, in the UK, which is really, really bad, actually. And I found this cool resource on here, which is called addresspollution.org. This only works for um, the UK, but basically this website that is, that is attached to this article is addresspollution.org, and I'll put a link to that in the chat as well. And it's just a cool little, super simple website um, where if you know any British postcodes, or I should say, um, yeah, British postcodes, you can put them in. Um, so I used to uh, live and work for random periods of my life um, in London. And so I remember one of my um, areas that I was in quite often was South London, Clapham. So I put in the postcode, which is basically the zip code from there. And I typed it in and it says, um, very high air pollution. Um, 
this address, which is a South London address in Clapham, is a very, very nice neighborhood. Um, and it says very high air pollution. This address is the 94th national percentile, exceeds three WHO limits. Then they talk about what the pollutants are, levels and health effects. And then um, there's a button that says demand action. So if you just Google the address of any place in London, um, you know, uh, you could do Royal Albert Hall or, or whatever. And then you just, you can put in the postcode and you can read about this. And I, I wonder if there's a resource that's, um, that's in America that we can use or maybe a global one, but the demand action button, um, is basically connects you to uh, a petition and I think probably also a newsletter. And the data, it says here, air, air quality data supplied by Imperial College, images from Google. Um, so also it says here, it's brought to you by the Central Office of Public Interest, um, which uh, the COI is that, and it says it's a creative industry alliance running the national awareness campaigns government should be running. So this is basically like an amazing group of people who've put together um, resources that, is, that are designed to help influence government in a positive human forward way. And it says here, join us or support us when government fails, we have to act. So that's um, central office of public interest.com and central office of public interest.com runs the address pollution.org, I guess you could call it a widget almost. Um, so anyway, I just thought this was such a cool thing. And anyway, this article in the, in the Guardian, which is where I got that website from, is talking about um, how severe concerns over air quality have really um, gotten uh, more prevalent in the press, especially since COVID, because uh, asthma is really serious and of course um rising cases of asthma are, are happening all over the place but also because covid was so focused on respiratory health so um i think you know maybe in a lot of ways this focus on respiratory health has influenced a lot of different um areas of thought and one of them being the environment itself which i think is incredibly um smart I'll just read a tiny, tiny bit from this. Campaigners, local authorities, and the pandemic have made us all more aware. In 2019, Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, brought in the ultra low emission zone, reducing the number of most polluting vehicles, but it's not enough. Eloquent Rosamund Kissy Debra, whose daughter Ella died at age nine in 2013, the coroner citing air pollution as the cause of death, has constantly spoken out. Government, she rightly says, is failing the public. And then came the pandemic. So basically, they're talking about how people have been discussing air pollution in major, you know, rich countries, rich countries, rich cities, places um, where millions of people work. And it's not just a concern of poor neighborhoods anymore, um, although of course, environmental racism was a great special by John Oliver last week. I highly recommend everybody watch the environmental racism episode, but um, we, need to, uh, we need to get this done because one of the answers to COVID and long-term disease spreading is to have good ventilation. But as it points out here, the ventilation is not gonna work when the open window to the city gives you a different um, illness. So I just wanted to see if anybody is um, familiar with any of this or has any thoughts. I'm not familiar with it. Um, I guess the I idea of the address pollution.org is to um, to pressure, uh, to create a legal obligation for estate, I'm just reading from their website, for estate agents, landlords, and property owners. So I guess they're focused on, on the real estate industry and kind of making, um, making it kind of like, you know, uh, uh, a legal kind of requirement to disclose the quality of the air when people are about to purchase or rent a, a home or residence. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, of course, if that is too much of a burden on them, then they should be putting pressure on the government as well. You know what I mean? If you're a local landlord and nobody wants to rent your building or your place because the air is so bad, 
then maybe you should take action too. You know, I mean, I think everybody should take action. Yeah. Here's a little sidebar um, on that Kopi website, Central Office of Public Interest. Um, they say, uh, I like this quote. They say, we advertise, colon, for people and planet before profits. I kind of find that slogan intriguing and appealing. Yeah, maybe we should reach out sometime. Um, but here's another, uh, well, sorry, I'll just, does anybody else have any more comments about that story? Otherwise I have one more and then perhaps I can turn it over to Daryl so we can get Tom and Jim in on the conversation. Um, this is very fascinating. I, I found out about this, uh, I guess on my Twitter feed, I think. Um, and Greg, I'm sharing this specifically for you because you love John Doerr, who wrote the book Speed and Scale that Greg loves. And um, here's a, a report from Mercury News, um, but it's all over the internet. John Doerr gives $1.1 billion to Stanford for new climate school. It's the largest gift in Stanford history. John Doerr is a venture capitalist, who some people know. Um, and um, this is the second largest gift to a donation, or sorry, a gift to any university in the in American history, behind 1.8 billion that former New York Mayor, uh, New York City Mayor Bloomberg gave to Johns Hopkins in 2018. But it says here the school, this new climate school, um, is going to. Um, propel Stanford, which already has considerable facilities researching energy and environment to the forefront of climate research, among other uh, world's universities. It's going to be called the, the Stanford Doer School of Sustainability. Um, so let's see. Um, he has a net worth of 12.7 billion. If anybody wants to know, he's from St. Louis. He went to Rice University in Harvard. Um, he came to the Bay Area with no job, then was hired by Intel in 1974, working as a salesman and obtaining several patents for memory devices, which is so, I want to hear more about that as well. Um, so then he joined venture capital firm Sand Hill Road. He rose to become the chairman uh, and he helped lead early investments in Google, Amazon, Sun, Microsystems, Compact, Netscape, DoorDash, and Slack. Um, I thought this would be an interesting person to talk about today, um, since you guys wanted to talk more about the internet and technology. Um, but also, I just think it's really exciting to show another data point that illustrates where a lot of new investment is going. A lot of, um, a lot of, I guess you could say, tech boomers or people that made their money beginning in the '90s, early 2000s, are starting to cash out. Also. Um, we are going to see apparently one of the largest transfers of generational wealth from baby boomers to their children um, coming up probably in the next 10 to uh, 20 years. And so I think there's a lot of money that is going to be in the system also, or sorry, it gets re-injected into the system. I also was watching a very interesting little video about venture capital last night. And um, at least one person who worked in venture capital said that um, there's, a, there's too much money in venture capital right now and not enough quality companies. So there's kind of, it is competitive to get money. Obviously nobody wants to give millions of dollars to a project they don't have any faith in um, or is you know selling snake oil or whatever, but it was interesting. I never heard somebody say that there's an excess of money in venture capital and, and a shortage of, uh, of companies that people want to invest in. So anyway, I just wanted to share that news about John Doerr. Lots of money is going into climate. And I think that's good because um, a lot of people, just my final thought on this is a lot of people really still don't have the facts on climate. Um, the IPCC has stated that we need to reach peak emissions by 2025, which is in two and a half years. Um, if we want to limit warming to a point where human civilization is, is certainly going to survive, and of course, we know that even with the Paris Accords, we're set to go past three degrees of warming. And at two degrees, the coral reefs will absolutely go extinct. 
Um, so this is definitely a crisis. It's definitely an emergency. It's not something that is just simply handled because of Tesla, for example. Um, although, you know, driving an EV is great. So I'm just going to pause there um, for comments. And then Daryl, if maybe you want to take us into the direction with Tom and Jim, that would be great. Sure. Um, yeah, I basically um, when we had okay, we had we had our call on Wednesday, the kind of members hangout call that that, you know, it's kind of it's in Jim's room and it's been going on for years. Um, and in that call, um, I just I learned more about about Jim, which is odd because I've known Jim for quite a while now and I thought I knew a lot about him, but he just continues to blow my mind. Um, and so I just thought, you know, it would be great to just make him a guest on our, our cast and just kind of learn a little bit more about Jim's history and, and how he got involved with our chain and, um, you know, what the, why of his presence here. <laughs> and, um, and so, yeah, so I would just love to kind of turn the, turn, turn the mic over to, to, to you, Jim. And, uh, I, I would like to know a little bit more even, you know, about, about just your earlier history, like what got you into computers in the first place? Um, and, um, and, you know, where, where that took you and, you know, even pre-college years, because I don't know that, that part about your life. Uh, oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I've had an inc incredible uh, uh, experience uh, starting working for my family's company, loading trucks. I had several hours to kill waiting for my father to drive me home. And I helped out in the office on the unit record equipment. So we had a room full of machines with card sorters and compute machines and punches hmm. and printers. And they weren't really computers because the way you program them was on these big pegboards. Wire column one to the uh, of the card to column one of the adder, you know, uh, no. and then the, the total goes to the printer, you know. It, it, so it was all these like wire boards. <laughs> <laughs> and we would pull these wire boards out of the computer and get, go into the storeroom, get the next application wire board, and put that in the machine and. Uh, and and run it and so i would just help them out running programs uh mostly uh, uh but then they got like one of the first binary computers that you know that was really developed for scientific purposes because the com commercial machines all cost a million dollars but the binary computer only cost a hundred thousand and you could do everything on a binary computer and I guess my dad was just one of the first people to learn that. It had huh. this 1130 computer, uh, 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 which I uh, uh, programmed um, uh, uh, vehicle scheduling, uh, routing, uh, warehouse scheduling. Uh, I mean, we ran everything on this 8K core memory machine with uh, uh, 1.2 megabyte disk drive. And um, uh, there's hardly a circuit board in it. You opened it up and it was just a rat's nest of wires and transistors. Wow. <laughs> so um, how old were you when this was going I was, on? I was 14 when uh, nice. I was first exposed to it. And then when they got the 1130 computer, I went to IBM school, which was free for IBM customers. So I took every course I could take for you know, mm. operations, research, uh, 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 assembly language, uh, uh, every, every language. <laughs> I ended up developing uh, applications in several languages. But then I became bored, like, there's 100,000 programmers working on these same applications all over the country. There's got to be a better solution. Actually, I covered that in the video. This covers uh, the next phase. I was very fortunate to start 
uh, in research and development and collective intelligence back in 1974 when the head of the computer science department said nobody would ever waste the power of a computer doing electronic mail. Uh, Dr. Murray Taroff and Roxanne Heltz uh, established the Computerized Con Conference and Communication Center at New Jersey Institute of Technology where I had gone back to school after five years in data processing to study artificial intelligence. And Murray said, you can spend your whole life and you might build a computer program as smart as one human. But consider the possibilities if we could develop a collective intelligence. And that's been my life's quest. It turns out to be a lot harder than we thought it was. Um, but we defined, Murray uh, defined, Taroff defined collective intelligence as the ability of a group to develop better problem solutions than the best individual in the group. So we would have everyone come up with a solution to a problem and then after the group experiment, we would see if, have experts judge the solutions to see which was better whether they did better. And the overall thing was that with common principles, goals, and specialized roles and tasks allow the emergence of a collective being when the group obeys behavioral norms, habits, processes, and structured communications sufficiently such that the group identity exhibits collective behavior that exceeds the contribution from the individual. And one of the things, you know, the main thing takeaway from the research is that there is a higher intelligence than the human intelligence, than the individual human. And that together, we can have a collective being that's greater than the self. And this is sometimes the fifth voice, or ghost soprano, you know, in a barbershop quartet or medieval music where there's a voice heard that is not sung by any of the participants but comes out of the combination of each one's part. Very quickly, <clears throat> big takeaways. Um, smaller, uh, smaller teams work better reporting to larger groups. We found that if you pair people two by two and then bring the two by two together and then bring them to the larger group, there was a greater collective intelligence, collective being created. Um, uh, the facilitation leadership. Uh, groups without leadership or facilitation did not reach consensus. They did, did not exhibit any, a collective intelligence, either with the group solutions. <laughs> Uh, with a leader, and, and even with computer feedback leadership, showing them where the agreement was and where the disagreement was, the groups developed a collective intelligence. Um, that identifying the agreement and putting opposing views together fostered these synergetic solutions, these win-win-win solutions. And uh, John Keldon has come up with a notion, which I think is good to share with the group here, that there's only two, reason, two, two just reasons for making a decision. It's either out of fear or it's out of love. And when we make our decisions out of love, we're going to get that collective intelligence. We're going to make better decisions. We're going to find that collective intelligence. Experimentation over planning, test alternatives, objective criteria. Uh, makes sense. Um, equal participation. Okay, uh, our face-to-face -face groups and some other groups, we had conversation dominated by one or two people. And I know I'm guilty of it, I'm sorry. Uh, usually male. And these groups did not exhibit collective intelligence, you know, where there was equal participation of both male and female participants, we got a greater collective intelligence. 
um, working out loud, uh, making people aware of the whole process of what's going on, what everyone's doing, gives that collective being uh, reality. <laughs> um, common habits processes, delayed choice, uh, engaging expertise, up to five experts. If you have more than five experts, you'll have a worse decision. You won't get the collective intelligence. Um, organic specialization, serendipity. Okay, when we have groups of people all doing little things by themselves, you get this serendipity that happens that invokes the collective intelligence. And then gamification, anonymity it added to the group, improved the collective intelligence when they could say what they really felt under the guise of anonymity or a pen name. Thank you very much. <laughs> So, Murray Taroff, who led the program, is uh, uh, attributed with the first chat program so far uh, in 1971. Um, the uh, 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 disclaimer, uh, a lot of the results I reported there were uh, not re reported results of the center. Uh, they were uh, results achieved with, sometimes with student trials that weren't weren't uh, published. Um, we published uh, we used actual work teams in the actual experiments. But um, uh, so I tend to I tend to uh, 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 exaggerate the findings to some extent. Some of it is just the the, the, the knowledge that was brought into the eyes effort uh, from uh, other sources as well. Um, uh, so I figured that would save some time and we'd go through the NGIT years. Now, I, Tom Moulton was an early programmer on eyes. I guess he started as an operator and uh, uh, started programming uh, ham radio applications. We had on ours user programmability, which we're building into our latest Argo system uh, also, so that uh, people could build their own applications. Of course, Tom worked on some uh, official work as well. Uh, unofficially, uh, he connected uh, the eyes system which um, electronic information exchange system pronounced eyes P I E S, um, uh, and uh, 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 he uh, developed uh, uh, a, uh, a radio, uh, amateur radio, decentralized peer to peer network where you could sign on to eyes from. Maine to Florida using a grassroots network, not, not intermediated by anybody, which is still taboo to this day <laughs> commercially to uh, uh, build uh, uh, these mesh network uh, 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 communication systems. But there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, a lot of exciting research. Um, Rao Bamadapati was the uh, uh, the manager of the IS2 development, um, where we were built, where the the initialized system was centralized, so we IS2 system was a decentralized network, which unfortunately ran out of fun which funds, which when you're building a system from the ground up, uh, it's difficult. And when you have all faculty spending their money on other projects, which we ended up delivering as part of EYES, 
the Eyes 2 project. Um, we, uh, we ran out of money and unfortunately it was in public domain. Uh, so uh, uh, I wish I had uh, the uh, decentralized object store that we developed for Eyes 2 today. <laughs> And many of the things we did with built on ice were rebuilt. We want to rebuild and you know, the, the original ice system didn't have the security, even ice two didn't have the security that is necessary uh, for a, a system, which is what has brought a lot of, uh, a number of people from the eyes background, including myself, Tom Moulton, uh, Rao Bamadapati, uh, Bill Kunj, uh, Gurinder Johar, uh, to our chain so that we can have a secure foundation for rebuilding the stuff we did back in the 70s and 80s <laughs> in a centralized, insecure manner. <laughs> wow, that is so amazing. So if you could, could you describe um, what eyes in a, in a, like to a lay person, <clears throat> what eyes is, what, what eyes was, what it was it attempting to accomplish? Well, the basic eye system, which we designed back in 74, um, uh, had, uh, uh, had chat, which isn't on here. <laughs> uh, it had uh, uh, email messaging. I mean, that was, that was innovative at the time, had conferences, which is groups, notebooks, which you store things. And it had a data program equivalency. So you could put in a notebook, a program, or text, and it could be executed. We had active tests where you could put functionality into your messages. So it sounds to me like kind of foundational um structure for a, a social network or a forum type uh right exactly um so well, i'm curious to know what you might say about um um the blue sky initiative um uh, uh what's his name from uh, twitter's kind of jack dorsey's kind of vision of a of an open source social network protocol do you know if that would somehow tie to the work that, that you were doing and want to be doing? Uh, well, it could be. I mean, I, I, you know, I've been excited about interoperability of systems for a long time. And I don't, you know, I think everybody should own, use their own chat interface. They shouldn't have, you know, you use their interface, they control you. you use your interface, you control them. Um, so, uh, yeah, having, a, having protocols. I mean, we have lots of protocols today. We have the, uh, uh, the ability to interoperate. It's just that the incentives are not for interoperation. The incentives are for domination. And there has to be some kind of anti-incentive of scale. Uh, I think for people to realize they should be using their own interface and they should be uh, uh, supporting projects that do that. But it's sort of like the, the mesh networking projects, you know, projects that liber liberate us somehow are uh, bought out or, uh, a, you know, attacked in some way uh, because uh, uh, there are powers that don't want us to have the power. So we just have to take it. <laughs> There's nothing really stopping us except for, you know, they program us like chickens. I mean, we're dumb animals. You know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, we don't, you know, the, uh, you know things like the, the monetary system and, and uh, crypto, you know, the, uh, there's uh, 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 a definite uh, crusade against them. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, the main thing that we had, I think the user programmability and the groupware, it's like we had, you know, different 
groups of scientists who were in the operational uh, trials that implemented, customized the system to their application for inquiry networking or um, uh, resource allocation. Uh, I mean, there were, uh, uh, so based on uh, some of the work from emissaries of some things, uh, uh, we, we ended up with hundreds of thousands of commands that most of them contributed from the user community. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that, you know, that's the, the, the kind of thing I'm try, trying to uh, rebuild in our chain so that people, you know, I write a contract and I share it with you and I share, you know, uh, 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 and you know, in the Argov, where you know we provide the basic tools for you to create any kind of governance you want. <laughs> it's like every group can be autonomous and have its own governance. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and also connecting with this idea of governance, I think was an idea that Greg had that I just want to make sure we're able to get that in. Greg, um, would you like to share your, your idea that you, um, that you gave us a little clue about in the chat? Uh, yeah, let me just get my air, air buds in one second. Oh, of course, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to, to, to get you um, Oh, with no notice, but basically what Greg put in the chat while he's getting ready. Is just... Yeah, no, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh, okay. Oh, um, please, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so there's, there's actually a little bit of history to this, um, uh, which is, uh, I, I've done a lot of work in the guitar craft and guitar circle community. And I put in that work um, largely because I saw in that, uh, in the techniques and uh, and uh, processes and practices, um, some significant coordination technology that I feel is of the kind that is both practical and necessary uh, to address the challenges that will be facing us and that are already facing us. Um, and um, as a part of my investigation of the, that work um, with a group of people in the guitar circle community here in Seattle and in New York, um, we took the work into the schools. So we worked with uh, fifth graders, sixth graders, all the way up through, uh, you know, 10th uh, uh, and 11th graders. And uh, it was very, very successful. Um, we, uh, the kids got a lot out of it uh, and they always wanted us to come back. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about the kinds of guests that we want here on our program. And I think it's really important to have people like Jim who have, you know, um, put a lot of time and uh, into uh, the sorts of technologies that we need um, and has a lot of wisdom about, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of cul-de-sacs and, and successes, you know, th rabbit holes that, that are never ending, but also also some, some areas that are fruitful. And I think we need to connect those kinds of people with the people who are going to be bearing the bulk of the challenge, uh, the, the main part of the burden of the world that we're leaving to them, and that's the children. And so I was thinking that we should have as guests um, entire classes. So uh, we go into schools and we and, you know, speak with the teachers and ask if they would be willing to let their classroom be a guest on the climate and coordination uh, podcast um, and, and get their feelings, what, what they think, what they think is happening and what they feel about it. Um, uh, uh, with respect to climate and, and, and uh, sort of uh, to, to get their perspective and to learn sort of where they are in their process 
uh, and um, and 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 maybe we can offer some information, and and they can offer us information. You know, one of the things that I've learned is that it's out of the mouth of babes. You know, it's like <laughs> so often I have I have learned things, um, even you know things about guitar playing from standing in someone who's who's strapped on a guitar for the very first time. And I think that that's that's also true about technology, and that's true about society. That that oftentimes the children can be the best teachers of all. And so my my th thought process is that we uh, we go into the classrooms, and and ask them to be guests on climate and coordination. Absolutely, I think obviously we need to get permission from the parents because of their identities and everything, but. Um... My, my hunch, if we were able to do it maybe in sort of anonymous way, but also quite um, honest, I guess, sort of, um, is that they would say no. I think they would say no, not because of that, but I think they would say no because these kids are traumatized by the thought of the planet. Like, I, I would love to do this. I think we should try. I think it would be really powerful, but I... I'm, I'm worried that they already would say, you know, the discussion of the earth's um, prospects into 2050, 2070 beyond is like, is, is too traumatic for a lot of people, which is, uh, yeah, really it's, it's, shows the state uh, of the situation. It's possible, but let's, 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 uh, let's definitely give it a, a, a go, right? Rather than uh rather than than kill it right away and also no i know, would I love I, I would love to do this i i want to tell you i'm on board with you i just don't want to traumatize anyone that's all and and high school students i think are are, are beyond being traumatized right so if we, if we if we go into high school students i mean they're, they're <laughs> you can't prevent them from reading the internet so um i think uh, that'll no, I'm, uh, I'm totally yeah. on board with you. I want this to be clear. I just think that could be a risk, but I'm, I'm, I would love to do this. So I'd, lo I'd love to um, hear a bit more about um, um, just your your thoughts, Jim, about where we're where we can go from here. So, eh, gosh, this was in 2010. There was a, a speech that Eben Moglin did called freedom in the cloud um i'm positive you're familiar with it um and in that speech he calls out for someone to to build something um and what it was was he talked about a, a piece of hardware that was like a he called it a a wall wart that was its own modem that you'd plug into the wall um and it would connect to the internet and it would hold all your data. Um, and I'm just kind of curious about where the idea of that could, could be taken now, because this was kind of a little bit pre-blockchain. He didn't talk about blockchain in it at all. Um, and I know there was a, a group of students that formed this, this community called Diaspora that attempted to kind of take his call to action seriously. I'm I'm just kind of curious, you know, what what you think of that because it almost sounded similar to what you were you were talking about. Yeah, I've been peripherally involved with diaspora, but um, um, uh, you know, I guess there's a couple of aspects to that. I mean, back in the '90s, um, we were forming a company of faculty and staff of NGIT, Xanthus, and. Um, uh, uh, one of the ideas proposed was the all-in-one. We had these PDAs, which were these personal devices that people would put in schedules and notes and things, but they didn't communicate. Except they did have a connector where you could connect, you could get a modem for them. Okay, so the idea was this all-in-one that you, we, you would you would uh, use for your communication and your data and everything. <laughs> but basically the idea was shot down. We said, mm. nobody's going to, you know, you know I, I'm not sure why it was shot down, but it was shot down. And then 
Well, then, then the iPhone came out, <laughs> you know, so it was a done deal. So uh, it's really, you know, uh, the, 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 the architecture that we're building or that, I, that I'm building is the same as ICE2, where we had a decentralized database, object store, where we did remote operations on remote objects. And um, it was fully decentralized and it was composed of user agents and group agents. You know, the user agent is what represents you on the network and obeys your rules. And of course, our chain is perfect for making rules that are algorithmically constrained to be obeyed. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, uh, so the self-sovereign data stack is user interface really would be in the personal device or in the computer and today's technology largely be browser based because everything you had in your user agent would be replicated in the group agent or uh, in other user agents as we back each other up in the encrypted uh, 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 encrypted, you know, we uh, in an encrypted way, you know, we have, we need the redundancy of our, of our data. Um, uh, but that's, you know, that's, the uh, technology that I'm uh, looking toward, and um, uh, uh, I'm hoping to get some leadership in the R Dev effort, which uh, in which I'm advocating uh, building this architecture. Which you know, the blockchain is great, but we need a peer-to-peer -peer layer. You know, we need Rolang in the browser. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I believe in the future, most transactions, most communications will be off chain. Now they may be, uh, the, prov the provenance can be put on the chain, the proof <laughs> of them. Um, but the actual uh, communications and transactions can be peer-to-peer. Uh, so okay so the so the you're saying the because i i'm kind of i i was always picturing that we would be putting almost everything on, on chain um how how do you have provenance if if some of the things are off chain well it, well if you need is a hash of the transaction and that proves it okay 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 in other words if i sign it and you sign it it's a done deal. Okay. And it's provable. But it's private. Okay. You, you, a public blockchain is not the place really for private information. Oh, okay. In so, opinion. okay. But there's an interesting tension there, right? Because um, we're so used to generating enormous volumes of information. And I know for myself, if I don't have the search ca capability, even on my private communications, I'm lost. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, and, and, so, and, and so, you, so, so yeah. the, I'm kind of the point of the R chain architecture is that it's not, it's not all public. You can run your own shard and you can make what resources you want. Absolutely. Public, and and right? the, pers the personal shard, the, you know, is, uh, and the group shard, and the uh, global shard are, you know, yes. uh, you know, uh, is is the architecture that uh, uh, that we need, right? But we also need a peer to peer yeah. layer. <laughs> uh, sure. I mean, at the end of the day, a peer to peer means you have a you have a, at least a communication substrate, right? From one peer to peer to the other, and so the question is, what is that communication substrate? Right. So. Yeah, um, and there's but 
but but you know what for, for me what's super interesting is 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 being able to do the search on the on the um the data that's that's because you know i i think that most people really really need to be able to manage their information that even on their private communicate like like today my private communications if i include signal telegram whatsapp uh wechat uh twitter instagram <laughs> facebook email <laughs> and all the email addresses i maintain uh it is completely unmanageable I, 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 I just I, I can barely keep on top of it at all. And I think and, that's always, always going to be a problem. You know, I mean, that's why in the architecture of the self-sovereign data stack, we have a GraphQL layer, which unifies the information in the, uh, in the browser uh, along with uh, 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 your uh, Archain shards that you talk to and Ethereum and uh, your Twitter and other things uh, into uh, uh, a, a, a single GraphQL query. Now the the the, the, the queries in our chain are, are are exceedingly powerful, and I think that you know you will put stuff there to uh, uh, to aid, aid you know to to help you query from the various backend services that you deal with. So, you know, you probably uh, 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 use it more for indexing. And, you know, even the query is going to take a, a, a fair amount of optimization before, uh, uh, before the queries become really uh, useful on large amounts of information. Um, so we have a long road ahead of us there. <laughs> um, but having the structure for it is the key, right? Yes. The yes. foundational structure, which no other blockchain has, so that we can build this on top. Right. So, um, <laughs> well, I, I hate to... I hate to, to uh, interrupt the flow here, but we have staff meeting in about a minute and a half. Yeah, so yeah. maybe um, maybe we should uh, call it here. Let Nora take us out. Yeah. And maybe, um, maybe sometime we should continue this with the early World Wide Web and my work. With, yeah, and Dan absolutely. Conley, uh, Jim White Scarver, uh, part one yeah. and part two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Maybe, maybe, we'll, yeah. maybe we'll do a prequel as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. but this is really High fascinating. And yes, we, we definitely need to do that. So, so thank you everybody for a great conversation. Um, hope everybody has a great weekend. Um, make sure you're subscribed to our chain on YouTube and following on Twitter and we'll see you on the next one. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Thanks, thank you. Yeah.